Letter thirty five of Letters from England, eighteen forty six to eighteen forty nine, by Elizabeth Davis Bancroft. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Letter to W. D. B., London, May fifth, eighteen forty eight. My dear W., last evening, Thursday, we went to see Jenny Lind on her first appearance this year. She was received with enthusiasm, and the Queen still more so. It was the first time the Queen had been at the opera since the birth of her child, and since the Republican spirit was abroad, and loyalty burst out in full force. Now loyalty is very novel, and pleasant to witness, to us who have never known it. London, May 31, 1848 Now for my journal, which has gone lamely on since the 24th of February. The Queen's Ball was to take place on the evening on which I closed my last letter. My dress was a white crepe over white satin, with flounces of honiton lace looped up with pink tube-roses, a wreath of tube-roses and bouquet for the corsage. We had tickets sent us to go through the garden and set down at a private door, which saves waiting in the long line of carriages for your turn. The diplomatic corps arranged themselves in a line near the door at which the Queen enters the suite of rooms, which was at ten precisely. She passes through, curtsying and bowing very gracefully, until she reaches the throne in the next room, where she and the Duchess of Cambridge, the Duchess of Saxe-Weimar, and her daughters, who are here on a visit, etc., etc., sit down, while Prince Albert, the Prince of Prussia, and other sprigs of royalty stand near. The dancing soon began in front of the canopy, but the Queen herself did not dance on account of her mourning for Prince Albert's grandmother. There was another band and dancing in other rooms at the same time. After seeing several dances here, the Queen and her suite moved by the flourish of trumpets to another room, the guests forming a line as she passes, bowing and smiling. Afterwards she made a similar progress to supper, her household officers moving backwards before her, and her ladies and royal relatives and friends following. At half-past one Her Majesty retired and the guests departed, such as did not have to wait two hours for their carriages. On Saturday we went at two to the Fete of Flowers at Chiswick, and at half-past seven dined at Lord Monteagle's to meet Monsieur and Mademoiselle Guizot. He has the finest head in the world, but his person is short and insignificant. On Wednesday we dined at Lady Chantry's to meet a charming party. Afterward we went to a magnificent ball at the Duke of Devonshire's with all the great world. On Friday we went to Faraday's lecture at the Royal Institution. We went in with the Duke and Duchess of Northumberland, and I sat by her during the lecture. On Saturday was the Queen's birthday drawing-room. Mr. Bancroft dined at Lord Palmerston's with all the diplomats, and I went in the evening with a small party of ladies. On coming home we drove round to see the brilliant birthday illuminations. The first piece of intelligence I heard at Lady Palmerston's was the death of the Princess Sophia, an event which is a happy release for her, for she was blind and a great sufferer. It has overturned all court festivities, of course, for the present, and puts us all in deep mourning, which is not very convenient just now, in the brilliant season, and when we all had our dress arrangements made. The Queen was to have a concert tonight, a drawing-room next Friday, and a ball on the 16th, which are all deferred. I forgot to say that I got a note from Miss Coots on Sunday, asking me to go with her the next day to see the Chinese junk, so at three the next day we repaired to her house. Her sisters, Miss Burdett's, and Mr. Rogers were all the party. At the junk for the first time I saw Metternich and the princess, his wife. End of letter 35. Read by Sibella Denton. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org.